You know what? It's time to praise the Lord. Let's stand together and let's sing a little bit. Let's just praise the Lord. All right, that's great. Sing it with me, everybody. Uh, let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Oh, sing it like you mean it. Uh, let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts to heaven and praise the Lord. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We Concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself and concentrate on Him and worship Him. So forget about yourself and concentrate on Him and worship Christ the Lord. Worship Him. Christ the Lord. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus my Lord. He's, he's the mighty King, Master of everything. His name Wonderful Jesus, my Lord, He's the great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is He. Bow down before Him, love and adore Him. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord, every knee will bow, every tongue will cry aloud, every heart will know you are worthy, Lord. Every eye will see. The beauty of your majesty, endless songs will rise. You are worthy, you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, you are worthy, Lord. Let's sing that again, everybody. Every will bow and every tongue will cry aloud every heart will know you are worthy lord every eye will see the beauty of your majesty endless songs will rise you are 
are worthy, you are worthy, Lord. You are worthy, you are worthy, Lord. Amen, and he is Brother Michael. Leading us in prayer, please, sir. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Never thank you for your goodness and ease in this place we can come and worship. Lord, just bless the music tonight. Lord, just be with the preaching tonight and touch our hearts. Father, just watch care of We just give you all the praise and thank you for this night. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for being here tonight, and it's great to have our guest with us tonight. Make yourself at home in the services. We are in the middle of revival, uh, literally. Amen? Amen. And uh, it's been good. Uh, we're rejoicing uh, for the two young men that have given their life to Christ Amen. and uh, follow, uh, choosing to follow him. Baptism will be later. Uh, Robbing was ready tonight. He said, I want to be baptized uh, tonight. And uh, we're going to wait. Matter of fact, my mom, of course, I'd asked Robbing's permission the night he got saved um, if we could share. We could, we could share about the news. And he said, sure. He said, yes. And I said, okay. Well, I shared the news. And, of course, there are a lot of people have uh, seen it and rejoiced with that. My mom immediately uh, checked in with me and said, when are you baptizing him? Because we're going to come. And uh, five hours away in Texas, and so we'll plan it out to where uh, they can come. And we're going to plan it around uh, Corey's work schedule and get with him. And so uh, we'll do it. And so we've had different ones that have uh, shared. And I was telling the adults that helped with the... Uh, uh, supper tonight uh, that I've had people uh, come in that have been talking about uh, just getting things right with the Lord. I've had people coming to me uh, wanting to get things right with other people. There's been people that said uh, we just want to, man, we want a stronger walk with the Lord. There's just been a, a lot of, just letting you know, there's been a lot of movement even here and there that's just... Uh, great and uh people saying i want to do things different and it's just been awesome and uh so just i want to encourage you uh letting you know that god's moving on on the hearts of the people and so just uh praise the lord for that i'm just so thankful and so thankful for you being here tonight this is the last night of the services and Easter Sunday. I hope that if you haven't got any Easter invite cards, I've just been dozens and dozens and dozens of them passed out already, different ones. Please join in on that. Grab a, a handful, two or three, a dozen or whatever, and give them to somebody that maybe hasn't plugged into a church somewhere. All right, I'm ready to sing some more, Brother Lewis. We're ready. All right, let's do it. All right, thank you, Brother Michael. I appreciate it so much. It's so good to have everybody here, and it's good to have these guys right here, uh, down here, and the Haley Creek boys are going to come up here and uh, play a little bit and praise the Lord. So guys, y'all come right ahead. Brother Michael has done a wonderful job this week teaching the plan of salvation. You know, I was thinking this week, uh, boy, he's covered about everything, you know. Uh, Jesus Christ coming to yeah, yeah. die on the cross for all of us. <laughs> and I got to thinking, you know, uh, you know, I, uh, y'all probably like me, I sit around and, and think quite a bit, have a little bit of time to think quite a bit between loading trucks. And uh, I think about Jesus and the angels in heaven and uh, the conversation that goes on there. And Jesus is probably telling them, He's already told them, He said, you know, I told them and I warned them or told them that in like manner I was going to come again. 
Yeah, and uh, when I do, then uh, we're going to be suspended in the air for seven years, and then we're going to go set up rule and reign on Earth, and we're going to rule and reign there for a thousand years. And you can only imagine that they're thinking, well, has the time come? You know, is it time yet? Said, no, no, the time's not yet. But the day's coming. I promise you, it's going to happen. And, you know, I've got a name for that, and we're going to sing about it, and it's called Heaven's Jubilee. Check. I wasn't nervous as long as I was back behind. I'm nervous. Be good. Be good. Be good. There you go, right there, Reed. All right, Timothy, kick her off, brother.
just getting ready now. Hang on. Who needs Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs and little Jimmy Dickens with that? Huh? Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. Trey, do you know who they are? <laughs> I didn't figure. Your mom said you didn't, so I'll take that. As... <clears throat> hey, that's wonderful. Thank you, guys. Man, isn't it wonderful to be able to praise the Lord with whatever God puts in your hand? You know, the Bible teaches that. Well, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Uh, the cymbals, the trumpets, the saxes, the strings, all of it can praise the Lord. I'm so glad y'all will use your talents like that for the Lord. That's wonderful. That's, got, that's great. Keep it up. All right, here we go, choir. Jesus Messiah. Well, let's do the choir special. We've got to do that, too. We've got to do that, too. We're going to... Let me get my notes here. It's always good for the music man to know what's going on. Sometimes he doesn't. <clears throat> We're going to sing a... a you know, those, those songs go way back. I mean, I'm talking about back before some of y'all were even thought about. But this one is, is more of a contemporary. But man, it's a, it's a great song. It just simply says, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, He's Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. So let's sing that, and then the choir is going to sing, uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul, okay? Uh, you may remain seated, but I do want you to sing it. Jesus Messiah, we're going to sing the verse. Here we go. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing, here it is, Jesus Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel. for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all, all our hope is in you. that and much much more if you know this little chorus that we're going to sing sing along with us worship the lord in it he's he's the lord and we're going to bless bless the lord oh my soul and uh, there's so many reasons why we should do that we're going to name a few of them after we get through we know that <coughs>
anything else, we can bless the name of the Lord. And he is so worthy. Uh, Caleb, you and the youth band can go ahead and come up and start getting ready, whatever you need to do. So glad these uh, young men and women will use their talents for the Lord as well. So y'all come right ahead.
It's not conservative or liberal, however they're defined. It's not about interpretation or the judgments of the mind. It's the opposite of politics, power and prestige. It's about a simple message. And whether we believe it's still the cross, it's still the blood of Calvary that cleanses sin and sets the captive free, it's still the name the name of Jesus that has power to save the lost it's still the cross now we can water down theology and preach a word to suit our needs we can justify sweet subtle lies that are wrapped in noble deeds. We can alter our convictions to adapt to social realms. But we cannot change the gospel or the truth contained within. It's still the cross. It's still the blood of Calvary that cleanses sin and sets the captive free. It's still the name, the name of Jesus that has power to save the lost. It's still the cross. Though some may say it's man's religion or ancient history, the cross of Jesus still remains the price for sin that sets us free. It's still the cross. It's still the blood of Calvary that cleanses sin and sets the captive free it's still the name the name of Jesus that has power to save the lost it's still the cross it's still the name the name of Jesus that has power to save the lost. It's still the cross. It's still the cross. It's still the cross. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, I finally get my turn. You don't know what it's like, Brother Mike does, just sitting over there, I mean, wanting to preach so bad. See, Trey? It's not me, man. It's not my fault. You got it? No? Joshua chapter 4 this evening. I don't know what it is. This thing doesn't like me, I guess. Joshua chapter 4. We're going to look at a few verses in the book of Joshua chapter 4. We'll look at verses 1 through 9. We'll look at verses 19 through 24. The book of Joshua chapter 4. And I want to say, as you're finding your place, thank you so much. I want to say thank you for allowing me the opportunity to come and present the gospel to you, it is something that is worthy of thanking you for. It is my privilege and it is my honor and I thank you so much for allowing me an opportunity 
uh, to come and share the gospel with you. And I'm so thankful for what God has done this week. And I hope you know that I am in full understanding that it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Jesus. And it is still the cross. And it is the blood of Calvary. And it is Jesus who can remove our sins and can save our soul and give us eternal life. And boy, I'm grateful for that. And I'm always thankful for the opportunity to be able to tell people about that. And I also want to say thank you for the meals that have been provided every night. They've been so wonderful and uh, so bad for those trying to lose weight and eat right. But, you know, I thank you so much for everything that you have provided uh, for me. And uh, I thank uh, Brother Michael, Miss Karen, and their children, uh, their family for allowing me to stay in their home this week. I know, uh, uh, I know what, it, what it means when somebody invades your space. And uh, I'm so grateful for, for your time and uh, for your hospitality. And uh, thank you, Promised Land, for allowing me to come and preach the gospel. And I know I speak on behalf of my Uncle Lewis as well. Thank you for your hospitality, your kindness, and sharing the love of Jesus with us. Joshua chapter 4 this evening. Last night, I prayed that you got over your Jordan. That you got where God wanted you to be. And uh, I want you to know tonight that it is of utmost importance to so many sitting around you this evening. And I want to just say it like this. It's of, of utmost importance, those sitting around you this evening, that you get where you need to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there are so many people, whether you and I know it or not, whether we remember it or not, there are so many people who are watching us live our lives. What you've got right here on this front row this evening, this is a special group of people. All around this room this evening, you've got a younger generation of people that most churches would give anything in the world to have. And I'm going to tell you, uh, God's blessed us at Calvary and Magnolia with a good group of children, and I know that, you know, it can be trying and tiring, but I tell you, traveling and preaching, you find out very quickly that that's the lifeblood of the church. I mean, it's there, the excitement is there. The energy is there. And if I can encourage you to do anything this evening, I want to encourage you, and maybe this is a little bit of a different direction in a message, but I want to encourage you to have a revival for these young people. They need to see what it's like for grown people to have a revival. They need that. They need good, godly leadership. They need that. They need to see people, and I'm just going to tell you, I'm not begging you to do anything but I'm just telling you, they need to see people and see what it means to repent of sins. They need to see people in the altar praying, weeping to the Lord, broken hearted over our sin condition. They need to see that. They've seen people this week, what it means to get saved. They need to see more of that. They need to see people follow the Lord in scriptural baptism. They need to see people coming to the Lord and having a revival and getting excited about Jesus Christ. Listen, I want you to understand tonight that they need to see that. They need to see some memorials in Promised Land Community, in Promised Land Baptist Church. They need to see something that they can look at and they can see the goodness of God. You know what that something's going to be? It's going to be your life. It'll be your life and mine that we would set it up as a memorial to God so that when they look at our lives, they can see, man, that's how God works. That's how God moves. That's what ought to be. When I get grown, I ought to be just like that. I remember that revival we had, and oh, I saw people going and praying. I saw people making things right with each other. I saw them making things right with God. Listen, our younger generation needs you to have a revival. They need it. And you know, that's biblical. That's exactly what happened in Joshua chapter 4. Chapter 3, they got over that, you know, God told them, we looked at last night, get where you need to be. Okay, have a revival. Get where I'm telling you to go and I'll bless you when you get there. Well, now in Joshua chapter 4, it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua. So they're over the river now. They're where they need to be. Notice what God said to do. He said, take 12 men out of the people, out of every tribe a man... And command ye them, saying, 
Take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm. Remember that? Twelve stones. You shall carry them over with you. Leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men, whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe, a man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you, that when your children, notice verse 6, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them. Look at the answer. That the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of Jordan were cut off. And these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded. They took up twelve stones out of the midst of the Jordan. As the Lord spake unto Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel... They carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged, and they laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan. The place where at uh, the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. Let's look at verse number 19, the same chapter. The people came up out of Jordan on the tenth day of the first month and encamped in Gilgal, on the east border of Jericho. And those twelve stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children, notice this, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan, this river, y'all, the water, on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters out of Jordan from before you unto where ye passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, help us tonight to fear you, to respect you, to reverence you, to honor you, Lord, we come before you, again, undeserving, but Father, so thankful for your grace. And we ask you, Lord Jesus, as we have every night, just keep doing what you've been doing. Just keep changing people's lives. Keep saving people's souls. God, just please help us to understand that we don't know how much more time we've got on this earth to make these decisions. And so they need to be made now. And God help us to have a revival so that this thing won't die out. Lord, we know services are going to end tonight, but God, let us understand what revival really is. It's not bound to a service time. It's not bound to the walls of this building. But God, revival lives within us. And we take it out and share it with those around us. Help us, Lord Jesus, tonight and bless this dear church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You see, a memorial is something that's established to remind people of a person or an event. That's how Webster defines a memorial. I think it's a pretty good definition. It's something that's established to remind people of a person or an event. And I want us to look this evening at this memorial that Joshua set up on the other side of Jordan when he got where God wanted him to be. But more specifically, I want to look at why God said, build a memorial. The first thing we see this evening in our text reading is the presence of memorials. As I was reading through the book of Joshua, again looking at this book of battles and victories that God gave to his people, we come to this part and it seems a bit strange perhaps as we begin to read it that God would say, take up some stones and then pile them up and build you a memorial. But why do you suppose that God wanted his people to build a memorial? I want to tell you why. 
They needed the presence of memorials. And it was because God's people then and now and always have been a very forgetful people. We are a very forgetful people. I'll give you an example of, the, of what I'm talking about. Maybe this will make it more clear for you in your life. When times are really going good in our life, we tend to forget about God, don't we? Well, maybe we need to think about the other end of it. When times are going really bad for us, what do we always tend to do? We tend to really draw near to the Lord. We tend to really pull up next to Him. For instance, if you're not feeling good, you get sick, you got a surgery coming up, you get a bad report from the doctor, so on and so forth. As we deal with the struggles of life, and much like God's people did throughout the book of Joshua, as we face battles in our life, when it comes time for battle, we tend to draw near to God. Anybody remember what happened in our country on September the 11th when the attacks came in? Boy, what did the whole country do man they just flocked to God didn't they are we still there I wouldn't I would not dare say we're still there at the feet of the Lord you know but but that's what we tend to do as God's people even in our own personal lives when we are in times of battle or struggle or trouble we draw near to God oh God I need you I got this going on I got this problem I need you to fix it I got this coming up I'm worried about that Lord I need you to do this and so God you know more or less we come to a Jordan in life and it's something that may be overwhelming to us and we don't know how we're going to get across it. We don't know how we're going to overcome it. But what does God do for His people if we're faithful? He parts the water. And oftentimes when God parts our problems like He did the Jordan for His people, we get to the other side and we start forgetting about the fact that God got us there. We forget about how good God has been. I want you to look back at the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 10. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 10. The Bible says this. <clears throat> and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. So when you get on the other side of Jordan, when you get over there where God is giving you, when you get to that land of promise, when you get to there where you're right with God, you're in His will for your life, listen to what He says. It cities, uh, and it shall be when the Lord thy God, when He brings you into that land, verse 11, and houses, He said in verse 10, you'll have goodly cities that you didn't build, houses full of all uh, good things uh, which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou have, uh, shalt have eaten and be full, then beware lest thou forget the Lord. Notice that. Beware lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. I want to tell you this evening why Promised Land Church needs some folks who will say, I'll let my life be a memorial. It's because we tend to forget about how good God has been in our life. And what specifically, what Joshua's dealing with here is there's going to be generations coming after you and they need something to look at and they need something to see. Listen, they don't need you talking about it. They need you living it. They need to see a memorial. What's a memorial? It's something that's established to remind people of a person or an event. What happens when they put a picture up here of a cross? What happens in your mind? You go straight to Jesus, don't you? It's something that draws our mind. It draws our attention to a particular event that happened in history. It takes our mind straight to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And listen... That's what our lives ought to be. Our lives should be memorials built around the goodness of God so that when we forget about how good God has been, we can look at the lives of those around us and we can say, oh yes, that reminds me of God. It reminds me of the changing power of Jesus. It reminds me of the saving power of Jesus. God told Joshua, you need a memorial in your camp and you need it there so that you'll You'll never forget how good I've been to you. 
Listen, we still need those things today. We don't need statues. We need lives. We need people. We need men and women who will stand up and give their life as a memorial, a reflection of the Son of God, Jesus Christ. You ought to be just like a cross. When people look at your life, they ought to go straight to Jesus. That's what people need. So we see the presence of the memorials. God said every time you see it, you'll be able to tell people about how I got you out of Egypt and I brought you to the promised land. It'll be a witness. And that brings us secondly to the purpose of the memorials. Notice God said you need them. <laughs> you need it. And this is why. Verses 6 and 7 of our text he says, there'll be a sign among you. It'll be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time come, saying, what mean ye by these stones? Verse 7, when ye shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it passed over Jordan. Listen, in other words, son, we hadn't always been here. I hadn't always been singing in the choir, see? I hadn't always been coming to church. I hadn't always been where I'm at right now. And I understand you can look at my life and now I'm where I need to be with the Lord. I'm on the right side of Jordan. I'm living in God's blessings for my life. But listen, I hadn't always been on this side of Jordan. Our lives ought to be so changed by the power of God that the younger generation can look at us and say, Man, what happened in their life? Why are they always so happy why is it that they never miss church why do they always tell people about Jesus why is it that they're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ why is it that they're willing to serve and do anything God said that's the purpose behind the memorials so that those who come after you can look at you and they can see the power and the goodness of God in your life God said there's going to be a younger generation that's going to come up and they're not going to go across the Red Sea like you did. There's going to be a younger generation come up and they're not going to cross the Jordan like you did. There's going to be a younger generation come up and they're not going to deal with some of the problems that you dealt with, hopefully, because hopefully they can look at your life and they'll ask you questions about your godly lifestyle and then you can tell them about how good God is to His people. We need those. You see, the purpose behind the memorial was not to sit around and bask in the accomplishments of yesteryear. It wasn't so that all the aged men could sit around and say, Oh, y'all remember? Y'all remember how many stones I carried out of that Jordan, you know? Nobody would help me. I had to do it all by myself. I got all the women and children across. Well, I had all the horses, so just leave me alone about it, you know? It wasn't for that. It wasn't so that they could sit around and talk about all they had done and all they, you know, well, I carried my kids on my back all the way from Egypt to the Red Sea, you know. It wasn't all about that. It wasn't so that everybody could sit around and boast and brag about what they had done to get to where they were and to, 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 to be where they were in their life and living in the blessings of God and oh, well, how much I'm better than you and how much more godly I am and how much work I've done and service I've done. No, the memorial, the purpose behind the memorial was so that the next generation could see the blessings of God on His people. That's what revival's all about. It's about understanding that there's another generation that's looking at me. You need to understand tonight that no matter how old or how young you are, there's somebody behind you that's looking at you. And it'll never end until you die. People will always be watching you. And our lives ought to be memorials. It ought to be a memorial pointing other people to the goodness of God. You see the memorial that God told Joshua, uh, Joshua to build among the camp there. It was a witnessing tool from the parent to the child. You and I need to get a good uh, firm understanding of this fact this evening. That Christianity is one generation away from extinction. If you and I don't live out the gospel in front of those who are coming after us, then how are they ever going to get it? 
We just expect people to listen. What is our motto in life? Do as I say, not as I do. That doesn't work. That's the hypocritical motto of life. We ought to be willing to give our life. <laughs> Listen, we ought to be willing when, when God moves us to follow. And you know why? I believe it's so that others will know. I wonder if there, you know, there might be young people in here tonight who've never really experienced a good moving of the Lord. I mean, honestly, I can think back. I was raised in a preacher's home. Uh, and, and the grandson of a preacher. I mean, I've been around church my entire life. I can remember just a handful of times that I was in a revival service where I really felt like, man, people are letting God have His way for real. I mean, this is the real deal. The Holy Spirit of God's moving and people are following. And I'm here to tell you tonight, the younger generation behind it, and you say, well, he's talking about those on the front row. No, no, listen. It's just the generation behind the generation that you you're in. Well, however that applies. Those that are after you. It doesn't have to be these young ones on the front. Listen, it could be folks of every age in this room. There's somebody behind you and they need to see you living your life as a memorial pointing them to the blessings of God. It's our duty in every generation to make sure that the next generation knows Jesus. And His deliverance. We are to train up a child in the ways of the Lord, aren't we? We are to take time to make sure that those who come after us, no matter how old, no matter how young, we are to make sure that those who come after us know Jesus. It's your responsibility to make sure that those after you know Jesus as their Savior. It's your responsibility. We have to take time to do it. I read a story once about a British poet by the name of Samuel Taylor Coldridge. The story goes that he had a discussion with a man who firmly believed that children should not be given any kind of formal instruction. But they should be allowed to freely choose their religious faith when they reached adulthood. Coleridge later invited this man who believed this way to his home and he took him into his very neglected garden that he had behind his home. He said, I want to show you my garden. He took this man back there and the man asked Coleridge, he said, do you really call this a garden? There's nothing but weeds here. Coleridge replied, well, I don't want to infringe upon the liberty of the garden in any way. I was just giving it a chance to express itself. See, if we don't have some memorials, then we can't sit around and point a blaming finger at those who come after us for the lifestyle that they live. It's hard for me to point a finger at the generation behind me if I'm not doing my very best to live my life as a memorial, something that expresses the goodness of God, something that they can look at and they can see and they can say, man, God has been good. God is good. God has delivered. And God has blessed. And in verse 24, the Bible tells us of Joshua chapter 4, that it, yes, it starts with the children, but what? That all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. You see, it starts with those who are after us, but the goal of the memorial is that it spreads from those who are after us to the whole and entire world, that all the world might know that the mighty hand of God, it's strong, it's good, it protects, it provides. Listen, that our God is the living God. That's the purpose of the memorial in Joshua's camp, and that's the purpose of our lives being memorials, that those after us might see us living in the goodness of God. Notice the permanence of these memorials. He says in verse number 7, These stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel <coughs> forever. Forever. This memorial would be a perpetual declaration of the delivering and powerful hand of God. You see, this memorial that God tells Joshua to build it would have an everlasting impact on those generations who came after them. 
And this just causes me in my mind to go to, well, what type of memorials could I build in my life that would have a permanent and everlasting impact on those after me? Well, first of all, I could have a godly faith where no matter what I deal with in my life, even in the hardest of times and the biggest of the Jordans, I never lose my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That I allow Him to have my life, to have my soul, to have everything I am. And I place my full trust in Him. You know, if I would have a good, godly faith in my life, then it would make an everlasting impact on those who come after me. They would see, listen to me, your children and those that aren't even children who are just in the generation behind you, what they need to see is, is that your faith is not in your money, it's not in your job, it's not in your talents, it's not in yourself, it's not in anything to do with you. You, but your faith and your trust is only in Jesus Christ. And if we would live a good godly faith, it would make an eternal impact. It would be a memorial so that all could look and see. Man, even in the hardest of times, they still have faith in God. Why? Because the hand of the God is mighty. And we could have a godly faith. You know, another memorial that I thought about that I could have in my life that would make a good eternal impact on those after me would be if I would have a godly family. If I would just the purpose in my heart to pray with my wife, to pray with my children, to understand that just because we're a preacher's family living in a preacher's home that we aren't perfect people, but we like everybody else can make a, a conscious effort and strive and be purposed and on mission to be more like Christ. And you know, it applies to everybody. No matter if you're single, if you have children, if you're a family, no matter what your situation is, we ought to strive to be godly people. And if we could have godly families where men will stand up and be like Joshua and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If we would just have good godly families where husband loves wife and children respect parents and people love the Lord, it would make such an impact on those who come after us. You know, we had, not too long after I had been at Calvary, we, <laughs> in Magnolia, we had a couple who, you know, we, we deal with divorce all the time. I mean, it, it's just, it's an epidemic everywhere and everybody at some point, we've all been affected by it, at some, but somewhere in our families. And you know, it's an epidemic and it's just, it's so widespread. And you know, what hurt us so bad one time, we had a couple who'd been married for 30 years who got a divorce. And man, you're talking about hurt people. You, you talk, because you know why? Their life was a memorial. People looked at that and said, man, 30 years, you know? Boy, that's strong. You know, when, when we allow the world to creep into our families, and when we allow mom to take on the role that dad should be playing, or mom has to take on that role, or wife has to take on the role that husband, and when children take on the role that mom and dad ought to be doing, and for whatever reason, mom and dad feel like playing child for a while. You know, when all that starts happening in our families... What it's doing is it's taking down the stones from that memorial. When we lose faith in Jesus Christ, it's taking down the stones from that memorial. You know, something else I thought about was if I would have a good godly focus in life, it would help the generations who are coming after me. If I would focus every day more on Jesus and less on self. If I would have more of a focus like John did where he said, I must, he must increase and I must decrease. If I would have a godly focus where God was first in life and I thought about witnessing to people and sharing Jesus with people and telling my children how to lead other people to Jesus and even leading them to Jesus. If I would make it my purpose in life to focus on Jesus Christ and let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. If I would just focus on Jesus instead of focusing on all the negative of the world and on all the 
sin in the world, if I would just focus on Jesus, it would help those who come after me. I wonder tonight, what have we really given the next generation to stand on? What have we really done for them that really matters to God? And I want to emphasize this evening that I know when we talk about the next generation, our mind goes straight to these children. But listen, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's for those who are, who are well-aged, who, you know, those middle-agers coming up behind you. Maybe they've lost their way and they need to find it again. And I'm just here to tell you folks, it's never too late to start living for the Lord. It's never too late to go down there to the Jordan and gather up some stones and set up a memorial and say, Hey, now every time you ask me, I'm going to tell you, God's been good. He brought me out of Egypt. He brought me to the Red Sea and He got me across. I wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, but thank God when I came to the Jordan, man, it was overwhelming. But when I put my feet in the water, God just parted it like that. I hadn't always done the right thing. Hadn't always been where I needed to be. As a matter of fact, I just told you I wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. But when I got ready to get where God wanted me to be, God helped me. And He blessed me took care of me. I want to ask you tonight, would you be a memorial? Would you bow your head this evening? <clears throat> we need memorials. We need them so that those around us can see God and His goodness. Those memorials are your lives. Folks need to see they need to see what it means to have a revival. You know, it's, it's amazing to me, and I'm just going to share this with you while, while your head's bowed. But it's amazing to me, the number of people that have said, Brother Mike, I wanted to do this, but I just didn't know what to do. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to go down there in that altar and pray, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to do it. I wanted to come talk to you, come ask you, but I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to do it. And I thought, man, how sad, because surely in a house full of people, somebody should have been a living example. Somebody should have been the one that said, that's what I need. I know what I need to do, and I'm going to do it. Tonight, if you need to be saved, I want to ask you the same exact thing I've asked every night. Just do what you need to do. If you need to come talk to the Lord in this altar, you need to come talk to your pastor. Just do what you need to do. You want to make things right with the Lord? You want to come for baptism, church membership? Surrender your life to the ministry? You want to come talk to the Lord about some sins? You just want to come thank the Lord. Give Him a little praise tonight. I just want to ask you to do it. There's a lot of people sitting around you. They may have the same burden you have. Maybe they're just waiting on you to move. Maybe they just need to see a memorial. Something that will reflect them to Jesus. Would you be that memorial tonight? Father in heaven, we ask you for boldness. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to help us to overcome all fear and anxiety. To help us to overcome all things that might hold us back from being who you want us to be and where you want us to be. Father, we pray tonight we would move for your honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand? The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? And now he is waiting again.